We're all familiar with the Protestant Reformation, but are we equally aware of the outcomes of that event? One of the most important of which is the right to private interpretation. You see, the Reformation put the Bible back into the hands of the layman. But R.C. Sproul said it so perceptively. Private interpretation never meant that individuals have the right to distort the scriptures. With the right of private interpretation comes the sober responsibility of accurate interpretation. Private interpretation gives us license to interpret, not to distort. We're examining the second step in Bible study. Namely, interpretation. Remember, here we ask and answer the determinative question, what does it mean? And we are in the process of setting forth five means of interpretation. The first of which is content. That is, what do we discover in the process of observation? that will provide a basis for intelligent and accurate interpretation. That provides the database. That provides the raw materials out of which we're going to construct the building of meaning. The second one we looked at is context. That is, what goes before, what follows what produced this passage, and what did this passage produce. Now, in this session, we want to look at two more. First of all, we want to look at the important element of comparison. That is, of comparing Scripture with Scripture. You see, the great interpreter of Scripture is the Scripture itself. Donald Gray Barnhouse said it so clearly, you very rarely have to go outside of the Bible to explain anything in the Bible. And that's very instructive coming from an individual who was incredibly well-read, who used very wisely secondary sources, but he understood the priority of the Word of God. You see, the more you compare Scripture with Scripture, the more the meaning of the whole Bible will become transparent to you. The parts take on meaning in light of the whole. And remember, although we have 40 different human authors, the 66 books are ultimately the result of one author. That's the Holy Spirit who's coordinating the entire message. It's integrated. It hangs together. Now, comparison points up a great need you have, and that's a need for a concordance, and particularly extensive use of the concordance. We're going to talk about that more in another session, but a concordance provides a tool whereby you can chase down terms. You can follow through concepts. You can put together things that you study in isolation, but that take on greater meaning in relation. Let me give you a couple illustrations. 
First of all, you want to chase the word believe, one of the most determinative terms used in the scripture. And of course, it is used in a variety of ways, especially in the Gospel by John. For example, in John chapter 2 and verse 23, we read these words. Now, while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not believe in them. For he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. You see, they believed superficially on the basis of the signs. It was obvious he did them. These are the facts. But facts do not save you. They are an essential basis for salvation. But I've got to believe. I've got to embrace. I've got to use those facts on a personal basis. Let's suppose that you came to me at the end of the session and you said, Prof, I hate to tell you this, but I'm suffering from a terminal disease. And we talk about it for a while, and I ask you something about it, and I say, man, fantastic. I've got a doctor friend in Houston who has just come up with a proven cure for that disease. And if you'll go there to him, I'll guarantee you, you will be fully cured. And you say, boy, that's wonderful. I say, you believe it? Oh, certainly, man, you said it, I believe it. And I reach out and grab your hand, shake it, and say, you're cured. See, by now you say, Hendrix, you know, I got a good psychiatrist here in Dallas you probably could afford to go to. You see, no amount of information concerning a doctor in Houston who has a cure for your disease will do anything to bring healing to your body. You've got to go there. You've got to submit yourself to his treatment. You've got to benefit from the medicine that he prescribes. And the same thing is true in the scriptures. In fact, he goes on in John 3 and 4 to give three interesting exhibits of his omniscience concerning what was in man. First of all, Nicodemus in chapter 3, the woman of Samaria in chapter 4, and the nobleman also in chapter 4. And the fascinating thing is he has skill to work with different kinds of personalities. And what he did intuitively, you and I have to do by study and the development of the skill to discern people and whether it is genuine or not. Let's suppose you are studying the book of Ephesians, another fascinating book that tells you how to live a heavenly life in a hell-like world. And you come across this remarkable verse of Scripture. It's found in verse 11 of chapter 4. It was He, that is, the risen Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why? To equip God's people for works of service. Now let's suppose you say, man, I've learned in Bible study methods, I've got to chase the terms down. So here's the term equip. How is it used? You get your concordance out and you discover three things. First of all, you discover this word is used of the mending of broken nets. The disciples were out fishing all day. Their nets became broken. So when they came in at night, they had to repair them so that the next morning they're ready to go. What a beautiful expression of the task of a pastor teacher. Because living in this world, your nets get broken. And you've got to come to get them repaired. Or the same word was used of the setting of broken bones. It's a medical term. Here are two bones completely out of joint. What does the doctor do? Well, he sets them. He brings them back in such a way that they can heal and develop into a position of former strength. That's exactly what happens in life. No such thing as living without getting broken up. And ours is a broken society. And we need to be under the word of God with someone who's equipping us, healing the broken bone. 
but it's also used of outfitting a ship for a journey. Here's a ship planning to go across the Mediterranean. My friend, there are no Safeway stores in the middle of the Mediterranean. So they've got to take on board everything they will need until they arrive at their destination. That's a grabber to me. Because what good preaching and teaching of the Word of God is to equip you for the journey of life. So that when you're out in the marketplace, when you're in a crisis, when you really need to know what God's answer to this is, you know it because somebody has equipped you for the work of ministry. Well, let's suppose, and by the way, you ought to do more of this, you want to study some biographies. Biographical study is fascinating beyond word. And let's suppose you get captured by the life of Moses. Well, you get out of concordance, and the first thing becomes obvious to you, and that is the bulk of his life is found in the book of Exodus. So you're going to do a concerted study of the book of Exodus to find out how this man got started, his remarkable parents who hid him because they were not afraid of the king's commandment until he became the ultimate, the quintessential leader of Israel. But you also discover in your concordance that there's something about Moses in Acts chapter 7. In fact, some of the most insightful historical material you will find editorialized by the Spirit of God is found in Acts 7. So I say any person who wants to study the life of Moses and doesn't go to Acts 7 is really out of it. But he's also in Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, he takes up more space in God's Hall of Fame than any other individual. Now I'm going to find Moses' life from the perspective of God. What does he think of him? Why was he significant in terms of his life? So, when you are studying the Word of God, keep putting things together so that you will come up with a full orbed understanding of the Word of God. I ran across a fascinating essay by a 10-year-old pupil that has some correct observation and some incorrect interpretation. It also has some correct interpretation with some faulty observation. The boy wrote, the cow is a mammal. It has six sides. Right, left, and upper and below. At the back, it has a tail on which hangs a brush. With this, it sends the flies away so that they do not fall into the milk. The head is for the purpose of growing horns, and so the mouth can be somewhere. <laughs> the horns are to butt with, and the mouth is to move with. Under the cow hangs the milk. It's arranged for milking. When people milk, the milk comes, and there's never an end to the supply. How the cow does it, I have not yet realized. But it makes more and more. The man cow is called an ox. It is not a mammal. <laughs> the cow does not eat much, but what it eats, it eats twice, so that it gets enough. <laughs> when it's hungry, it moves, and when it says nothing, it is because its inside is all filled up with grass. Now, that's the reason we need to be very precise in how we go about this process of interpretation. Make sure our observations are accurate, and then we have a basis of accurate interpretation. Well, there is a fourth way to interpret, and that's by using the cultural and historical background. A number of years ago, I was entertained in the home of a man in San Francisco who was an importer of exquisite oriental lace. We were going out to a meeting, and as we went out the front door, I noticed a little end table in the vestibule with a piece of lace on it, and I said, my, that's beautiful. He said, that's a piece of junk. I keep telling my wife to take that thing out of here. I said, how can you tell junk from good lace? He said, when we come back from the meeting, I'll tell you. And believe me, I never forgot. And when we got back from the meeting, 
He took me into a room with a large black table with a brilliant light over it, threw a massive piece of oriental lace over it, and then began to give me an explanation of how to tell the difference between exquisite lace and ordinary or junk material. And in the process, he made this comment. He said, you will never understand the exquisiteness of good lace until you see it over against the dark background with bright lights placed upon it. And I thought, that's the clue to studying the Bible. See, take the book of Ruth, for example. This occurred during the period of the Judges. Israel's Dark Ages. It was a cesspool of iniquity. It was a period of time in the culture when they couldn't tell the difference between Chanel number five and sewer glass number nine. <laughs> and the question is, is there anyone faithful to God during this period? The answer, look at the book of Ruth. It's a shaft of light in the midst of a very dark period. It's a brilliant lily sitting in a putrid pond. You see, here's a dear family, faithful to Jehovah, even in the midst of apostasy. Now, I've had people make sort of a snide remark. One guy said to me one time, hey, that's kind of a saucy book, <laughs> a little sexy. And I felt, you need to understand, my friend, that's a greater commentary on you than it is on the book. You see, this man was tipping his hand. He was saying to me, I don't know the front end from the back end of the culture of that period of time. Because when you go back and learn the culture and the customs, the backdrop, this is of the highest moral standard. Nothing cheap about this. This is no trashy novel you are reading. It's the highest form of literature, both in terms of content and morality. But our problem is we tend to read back into that period of time our history. Now let me illustrate this for you. One of the most important things in the understanding of background is to find out what was it like during that period of time. And by the way, art doesn't always help you in this. You all know about the Last Supper. Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece. The problem is, although it's a very beautiful painting, it gives you a totally distorted view of what the Last Supper was really like. In the first place, you will notice they are all sitting at a table. They didn't sit at a table in the time of Jesus Christ. They reclined to eat. And they usually did it by leaning on an elbow like this, leaving the other hand free and with a tortilla-like affair, put it into the sauce and bring it back. Now, this is very important to remember because this is why Peter could ask John, who is he talking about when he says, one of you is going to betray me without the rest of them hearing it? Because he could lean back, John could come forward, and they could communicate. You'll notice they're all seated on the same side of the table as if it's the speaker's table. You know, as if someone said, hey, guys, let's get on this side. We're going to take a company picture. The other thing that you notice is interesting, if you observe it carefully, is that you've got a 15th century frieze, which did not exactly exist in the first century. But it was a reflection of Leonardo's time. Then if you will observe rather carefully, you will notice it's daylight outside. But if you understand the scriptures, you'd discover it was dark outside. So you see, people, by looking at a beautiful piece of art, can oftentimes come up with a very erroneous interpretation of a passage of scripture. And it's not until you go back into that period of time and find out what was really going on that you can understand it. Or let me give you another illustration. I'm going to draw for you and show you what a brilliant map maker I am. You've got to have, by the way, just a little imagination to understand. 
This is the Mediterranean Sea, in case you didn't know. This is the Dead Sea. This is the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River coming down between them. In the days of David, he was down here in the south, and he had to go to the north. This was before he became king. And he had to pass a city by the name of Jebus. It was an ancient fortress, a hangout, and hangover from the days of Joshua, when they never took the land as God had told them to do. So every time David would go by Jebus, the soldiers would appear on the wall and they would taunt him and say, Hey, David, when you become king, don't ever try to take this citadel. We'll put cripples at the gate. We'll put blind men on the watchtowers and you'll never take it. And when David became king, he never forgot it. He said, that's the first thing we're going to do is to clean out that operation. Now, that's what Psalm 24 is talking about. When I was a boy in Philadelphia, they were allowed to read the Bible, but only the Psalms, only five of the Psalms, so we never offended any. And Psalm 24 was one that they were allowed to read, and I now know why. I used to hear, lift up your gate, your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong. You know, and I used to think, what in the world are we talking about? Who's on first? Now I understand why they're allowed to read this. Nobody would have a clue as to what's talking on. they're talking about. You know what's happening here? You see, David defeated Jebus. And now they are taking the ark back to the place where it belonged. And this is the processional hymn they are singing as they're going up the incline. And they are saying, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Tear down the walls. Enlarge the breaches. And the walls, as if sharing the ancient antipathy of their defenders, say, who is this king demands that we enlarge the gates? And the answer comes back, the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Now, you see, when you understand this historical background, then suddenly Psalm 24 comes alive for you. So every time you come to the word of God, my friends, make sure you compare Scripture with, with Scripture and make sure... You study the background, recreate the culture, because then and only then will it truly come alive.